Okay, thank you everybody for joining us this evening for this uh, wonderful conversation we're having. Um, Double Edge Theater and the City Company. Um, thank you for tuning in from afar. Uh, quick uh, order of um, housekeeping. Please, everyone that's here um, in the room, Turn the Wi-Fi off your phones. It'll help the web streaming for our audiences that are not able to be with us here. Um, and that'll be a big help. Um, you can turn off the phones, or you can just put them into airplane mode. Um, so we'll, we'll just uh, we'll get started. Um, my name is Matthew Glassman, uh, one of the co-artistic directors of Double Edge, and I'm. Oh, can more people? Hello. <clears throat> welcome, welcome. How are you? Here, there's seats over here. <laughs> so this conversation, um, I'm just going to give a, a very quick introduction to this. Um, this conversation is a part of a, a week-long residency that's an exchange uh, between our two ensembles. Um, it's in thanks to the wonderful network of ensemble theaters, uh, Exchange Grant, which has made this possible. Uh, so let's hear from NET. <laughs> and um, City and Double Edge have uh, a lot in common. A lot of differences and a lot in common, um, and has been crossing paths for many years in lots of different ways. Um, and decided for a number of reasons, a host of reasons, that it would be really interesting to share space together, to train, exchange training, exchange questions about how our ensembles work, um, and also be thinking about the future, the future of our companies and the future of the field and. Um, the future of humankind has come up in some conversations as well. Um, so don't worry. And the future of our students. <laughs> and the future of our students. Um, Which is dark. <laughs> and uh, as part of this residency, um, are the city company uh, conservatory artists who are here, um, Double Edge's uh, advanced immersion students and alumni uh, participants. So there is this question uh, for the two companies, uh, first and foremost about how, who and how we are as ensembles that um, have been around for a certain amount of time. Um, how is training a part of our work? How do we train? Um, how does that training go into our performances? And also, um, how do we relate to our, um, our idea of community? These are all things that were impetus, I think, at the beginning of, of when we first start talking about this possibility. Mm -hmm. um, and also, how, how do we connect and juggle these things? Um, training students, creating work, touring, um, and the administrative organizational components of our work. Um, how do we find holism? Where is there room for improvement? Uh, so these are the questions and themes that I think began um, our early conversations when we wanted to spend this time together. Um, Leon, do you want to add anything to 
No, that's, I mean, the more we talked in the, when we first started um, discussing plans for this, the more it became obvious that this was a, a thing that needed to happen. It was really kind of obvious. And every time we, somebody would have an idea, and there, there was almost, there was so little dissent, it was almost disturbing, because it was like, oh, you want that too? Yeah, that's what we wanted. Um, so it was a really hand-in-glove feel, which has carried through into the week, oddly, um, I think, for the most part. It's, it's been very, very successful, uh, as long as we don't screw it up tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Which I don't think we will. Or now. Or now. <laughs> We're going down in flames. Everybody's shutting off hell around right now. <laughs> um, but, it, you know, and, and it really is, I, I mean, I, I, I want to, again, uh, underline um, what Matthew said about uh, thanking the, the NET, the National Network of, or what is it? Network, Network of Ensemble, Ensemble Theaters. <laughs> Uh, because I, I think we've all experienced what's happened here as very much reflecting the goals of that organization, and, and I, th I, think, I think we've certainly, um, it's been really eye-opening to us to, to put our values in front of another company and to see those values reflected back uh, in a way that has illuminated our own work to us again uh, in, a, in a really interesting way that I think, I think we're going to be processing for some time in our own world and that perhaps this is the beginning of, of more adventures and hopefully our, our uh, student artists will be, will be part of that conversation as well. <clears throat> I'm wondering if we should introduce ourselves, at least by name and um, position or role, um, at least for people. Um, and then we can say a little bit about our, our, our companies in, in this context. Um, I'm Ann Bogart, and I'm one of the three artistic leaders of City Company, and the one who isn't here is Ellen Lauren. You're probably wondering why the women are on the outside and the dudes are in the middle. <laughs> what does it mean? <laughs> I don't know what it means. <laughs> Should we, uh, What's that? Should we switch around? No, 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 no. Uh, make a it was conscious. This was decided by chance operations. <laughs> no, it wasn't. No, it was it, completely conscious. It was actually I decided. Uh, <laughs> I wanted to sit on the end, How so unusual. I asked Anne if she wanted to sit on the end. No, you said which end do you want to sit okay. on? <laughs> That's the difference between a director and a good director. <laughs> a good director phrases it as a question, but it's actually a demand. <laughs> uh, my name is Leon Inglesrud, and I am also one of the co-artistic directors of the City Company. I already went. You did? I did, yes. yeah, at the beginning. I am Carlos Uriona, and I'm one of the three artistic uh, directors of Double H Theatre. And I am Stacy Klein, one of the three artistic directors and also the founder of Double Edge. So, so it's remarkable that we were both companies that started with single artistic leadership and then moved to shared artistic leadership. And we agreed that it might be a good idea to start with that conversation. Stacy, <laughs> what happened? <laughs> uh, okay, well, it started 32 years ago. Um, but I won't give the whole history, I guess. Um, well, we were, we were talking about this beforehand, and um, we realized that in both of our cases, this was an organic process that led to um, shared leadership. In our case, I think um, we shared leadership 
um, we share leadership with more than the three of us, but we also um, share, shared this kind of artistic leadership for a while before we identified that that was the way it should be. We tried, um, at, we actually have, are working with a strategic planner um, and um, we tried a bunch of different ideas for how the company should be, or what she calls the portfolio of the company should be. Well, because wouldn't that be interesting to know what those options were? No, seriously, don't you think yeah. so? Yeah, I mean, yeah. we like, actually the did the, some of those options. We even did some of those options predating her. Um, when, when we realized that Matthew was a leader and needed to be a leader and already was a leader, um, this was like three years ago, I think we tried executive director. And he was busy working his butt off um, for a really long time and like practically collapsing, um, but in a business way, in a like leading the business of double edge way. Um, so when we came upon this need to find another way, we, we ended up dividing all of our business, um, more or less our business leadership into seven um, people. So our ensemble is nine people and, and two associate ensemble members. Um, seven people are leading areas of the theater. Um, and Matthew was still kind of leading all of that work for a while. And then Matthew and Carlos and I talked about, this is not what we really mean by leadership. We want to have, really have the artistic leadership be that. And then we can still have a different organizational structure for the organization. So, um, we started that, I feel, after we actually were doing that. Because we, there's never like a project that we do where the three of us don't talk about it in a deep way. Or an idea, or even if like one of us is away, we're still uh, in sync about this, this project or whatever we're doing. Like, Matthew was the one that started this exchange and then went out of it because he, was, he wasn't even on the phone calls. Um, and, and that was okay because we, had, we really knew what we were bringing to it together. It's like a juggling that becomes necessary when uh, the growth that you're all working on manifests. <laughs> I would also say uh, we, we started having a shared artistic leadership long before it was declared so, as, as you say. And as a matter of fact, the ethos of the company has always been shared, has been collaborative. And the old hierarchical structure of artistic director, managing director, etc., didn't ever sit well with us. And, but I have to say that ever since we actually kicked it into real functioning, recognized us sitting here tonight with you talking about this, for me, it's been a huge relief. And I wonder, Stacy, if you felt the same way. I feel so relieved not to feel the weight always on me, whether or not I was actually doing the work, but actually the, uh, the um, emotional weight. Did you? Do you feel that better? I definitely think that relief is the operative word there. And in the sense of, um, I think that declaration or identification is, um, it's important because the world sees it differently. Yeah. So it's not like everything is coming to me. And when I don't even own everything, so it, it can't come to me. Like, I have to really think, well, they shouldn't really be talking to me about this because I don't know. So, um, 
and and also that ex that dialogue, which is fundamental to our training and everything else we do, it doesn't make sense that we wouldn't have a dialogue in our leadership as well. So I would ask the dudes here. Yeah. Um, so so <laughs> coming into a position of shared leadership from uh, from both Stacy and me. <coughs> Was that easy or hard or is it hard or easy or how's it going? <laughs> I personally, no matter what the director said, I always consider myself a director. <laughs> That's your secret. You should say that. Yep. And I always try. I've always tried to lead, not just in double edge in all the other experiences. I I try to be a leader of sorts. Um, it's something I like to do, and I think it relates to the amount of responsibility you're willing to hold. Like, I always think that one of the best, we have many activities that are non-theatrical, but I think are very theatrical, a double edge, and one of them is moving furniture. You don't know how many times we move things around on the, on the span of a day. Like, these things weren't here today, they're all here, and they're going to be gone by the time you're gone. So. There is a metaphor when you're moving something. Let's say that you have a team of five or four that are gonna move a gigantic piano, right? It's all about weight and distribution of weight and also looking at the space, <coughs> the time, the same as an actor. That's why I think it's a wonderful practice, both for a group dynamic, which theater is a group dynamic, and for, uh, for theater, which is a group dynamic, so it's, it's good. But if you observe, there is somebody always that can hold several weights at the same time. The weight of the piano, but also the weight of the, of the how the piano needs to fit in that little door that doesn't seem that it's going to fit, and how you tilt or not, and somebody's calling the shots. So that is about taking responsibilities, different sort of responsibilities. That's how I see myself. And I'm, I'm, not all, I'm not the one that maybe is calling shots around, but I'm always trying to hold things. And I think that, you know, it's being natural so far. I, I think that one of, the, like Anne said, and, and is, is becoming evident was true for Double Edge as well, internally the, the dynamics of how the company was being steered had always reflected this. And there's been, there's been a little bit of a, of an uphill push to get people on the outside to understand it, uh, and and to um, to take it into account and change change practices. Uh, but it's you know, when we when we made the decision to make it official, I remember one of the things that somebody in the company said. I don't remember who it was. Said, "Well, it's more honest this way. This is this is." it's more honest to the outside world that this is the way that we actually operate. And some of, you know, there's one way to look at shared leadership as saying, you're taking this thing called leadership and you're cutting it in, you're cutting that pie into three pieces. So now you've distributed it across three people. There's another way of looking at leadership that says, now you have three pies. You have a lot of leadership pie now. And so everyone gets more pie, right? And, and that's, that, that's actually the way it works. And, and maybe it's even exponential. Maybe it's, it's actually you've cubed your amount of leadership because it tends, it tends to, to grow um, exponentially. I have a question about that then. So does that mean that there is more work and more work in the sense of growth as well as more work. Doesn't having more leaders generate more work? We are about to take that on. We, uh, the, the, the city companies, <coughs> we're, we're right in, the, in the, the, the early stages of a kind of shift in direction that for us is the shared leadership uh, coming into fruition in a sense. And what that shift is, is changing our, our model of creating work from a model in which we're making one big piece at a time, 
uh, and, and we've always had several works sort of in the, in the pipeline or, or lined up, uh, but usually we've concentrated on one thing, tried to get our funders behind that, get a commission for it, and, and off it goes. And we put all our energy there. We're changing from that to a strategy of trying to make multiple works simultaneously and to complicate it. And to, to launch that, the first, the first part of that that we're doing, each of us three artistic directors are gonna direct a play. Just to sort of lay that out really <coughs> schematically for the world. Uh, and so that's, that's gonna bring that up. If, what is, the, the, the better answer maybe in terms of the past is to say we've gotten things done that weren't getting done before more than it had than it created work. Mm -hmm. it, it meant, it's meant that our staff and uh, our, our company members have had more access, hopefully, to leadership, to be able to, that we don't have to, we don't have to wait to, to get to Anne to, to solve a problem. We can just go, okay, we'll, we'll just do that. Right. Oh, by the way, in the spirit of non-hierarchical and non, patriarchal structures. You, if you have a question, we, we don't have to wait for the Q&A section of this evening. Just shout it out in the spirit of the way we work. No, um, not now. Also, uh, except, you, <laughs> except you, Casey. And same with online questions. If anybody online out there has a question. Uh, can, we, can we first hear from you, Matthew, about this and then start the questions? Yeah, um, to answer your question, and uh, it, it, it is hard. Um, and really, uh, and sort of like really profound in a way, I'd say. Um, sometimes it feels really precarious, and uh, it's, it's sort of moving to me, I have to say, because you know, I, I, at some point I, I looked up the etymology of the word precarious and I think it has to do with uh, n the feeling, it actually relates, I think it ultimately relates to God, but uh, no it does, it, in, the, in the etymology of it, do you know? No, in the etymology it does have something, it's some, the, the word is used in there, um, but it has to do with not, not having the faith that, uh, that when you fall you'll be caught. So that's what it is to be in a... carry us. And so uh, the feeling at times... Uh, the feeling at times is precarious. And maybe it's because there is um, a really necessary interpersonal tension. Um, and then you're, it feels like, or you are high off of the ground when you're on that tension or on that line, and you don't know if, um, if you'll be caught, you know. Um, and then it has these amazing rewards when you know you feel like you are being, you're caught, that you're the person that you're, you're working with, or you're trying to find in these sort of labyrinth, it's sort of labyrinthine, the spaces of, of finding out how to lead together. Um, and you face the doubts of, you know, as, as I'm sharing the search for um, either autonomy or, or power or um, visioning, um, not knowing, uh, not knowing if, if you are really together or not. Mm -hmm. I think Carlos's notion of, or, uh, uh, metaphor of, push, of moving furniture is a yeah. really profound one because the, the, the notion or maybe it's like a Ouija right? You put your fingers on the Ouija board, you ask a question and then you see where it wants to go. It's similar to moving um, furniture. You know, it, is, it is similar. Ouija is similar to moving yeah, furniture. Yeah, Ouija. <laughs> but, but the interesting thing, like if you lead a group of people who are moving a piano, you don't, after that process is over, say, I moved the piano. You say, we moved the piano. Right. And that's what being in an ensemble Well, I want, oh, let's, okay. Um, actually, 
along the same line of the moving the furniture metaphor, which I love. Can you be louder? Yes. Um, <laughs> I want to know if you know of any companies, or if it would never work with a company, depending on the size, at what point does the artistic directorship separate from the rest of the ensemble? And would it ever work that everyone in the company would share in the artistic directorship? There, there are examples of that. I mean, the, the first one that pops to mind is the, the Rude Max in, in Austin, Texas. They are all producing artistic directors wow. of the company. Mapu Minds, they're all artistic yeah. directors, too. That's true, yeah. yeah. What is the separation of the responsibilities? When, what, how does someone's responsibilities dictate that their title is artistic director of a company? What, what are the differences? I think it's described in the title, artistic direction. <coughs> that who is, who is saying, you know, what a director does you, is <laughs> usually quite wrong. You can, we're going over this way. That's what a director does. You don't really know why or what. And everybody says, OK. But, <laughs> but you do that in terms of the artistic issues of a company. That's, it seems like a really good description, artistic direction. I think that there are jobs. You can, if you look attentively, you know, however amount of time in theater you have had, already you will see that the jobs are they're sort of clear. Um, I want to say, and I wanted to say, that we were talking about history today a little bit because remember Anne mentioned about Stanislavski? There has been responses to, to techniques and methods of organizing theater. <clears throat> Although theater has been organized for 2,000 years, we're still reorganizing theater. And th this is because we don't work on a vacuum. We, re we are part of a society that is larger uh, we, we are a part of something that is larger than ourselves. So the fact that Stanislavski and then Lee Strasberg re responded to, to two uh, systems of production, the Russian communist and the American uh, Western Europe capitalist, which is responded to movie, they responded, they were part of a, a, a machinery, and they were creating something within there but then at the same time, Meyerhold was creating something, and other people were creating something, and then, the, you know, Grotowski came about, and then Suzuki, and then, and then there are these responses that in some cases were patriarchal. Right now, we are in the presence of, of two leaders, and there are many others. There are ladies or uh, female leaders that have created a different, a different canvas for work. And I'm not really sure or articulate about that. The, the other night I said something was kind of like, um, it, it didn't come uh, through the way I wanted to think about it. And you were there. I was talking about that, Casey. Um, I think that this is also a response to, to a society that, that the way of production that we had until 1990, 2000, it has been crumbling. Therefore, the behavior of the society has been changing. The fact that a lot of the small business is now being a, a, two people on, you know, at home with the, with the internet is new. We have all been taught by a, a system of teaching that is prepared to prepare us to be in an assembly line. Well, that's, that's about to be gone. The schools as we know them are about to not be there anymore. It's, gonna, it's a matter of time. The way they were, there's going to be a, a different educational system. And we're seeing new responses. And we are, you know, I, I'm honored and I'm benefited from being around these people that are making these changes. And I also push for those changes. Now, this way of organizing so, socially is the same as marriages. You know, it's, there's not an accident that we have gay marriage. The, the structure of the families are changing. We need to understand this. It's economic, it's moral, it's spiritual, it's social. It's all of the above. It's anthropological, if you wish. You can look at it at any angle. This is also anthropological, and we are some, somehow a reflection of that. Well, well one, one thing to respond is these things aren't aren't defined. 
and you, as, as young artists now thinking about how you're building your own world, when we, when we make a company, even when we make a play, we're, we're making a proposal. We're saying, how about this? Right. Here's a way you might organize it. Here's a way you might make a society. Here's how we're going to try to get along. And we're trying, to be, we're trying to be thoughtful. We're trying to be mindful. We're trying to find the best in each other and, and apply that and be sensitive to what's going on in the world. That doesn't mean we found it. That means we found what our place is. You need to look at that and then go, okay, if that's your proposal, here's my counter proposal, because here's what you missed. That's your job. So it's not that those things are defined, those definitions. We made them up for us, given all the assumptions that we got from the previous generation. So then you have to go and make them up now, too, and do something that makes us look like a bunch of dinosaurs. I mean, I think that artistic director is it's it's not the same as owner yeah. um, and therefore it's not really comparable to ensemble uh, in in our group I'm more on Matthew's wavelength of precarious um, which I I like I think that every time you have the word art in something, you should be saying precarious. Um, but um, the organization is not precarious, and the, um, and the ownership of the organization is not precarious. And in Double Edge, all of the ensemble are owners of the organization. Um, so, and the direct, the board of directors. Um, so, in the sense that you could own a nonprofit, we are all responsible for the health and livelihood of the organization. But not everybody would want to be or is ready to be a leader of that. So, it's like that if that person wants to be then they would take the responsibility to work towards that there's no rule that says there can only be three or there has to be one or whatever it is um there's there's very few places that start with a whole group as um the direct the artistic directors and survive that because people are different and people want different things. So even like Carlos is saying how he's always been a leader, that's true, but he always refused to be one of the artistic directors. And in fact, wouldn't allow anybody to use the word director in his title. So this is a whole new reality. Uh, That's an old, it's an old anarchistic. Um, so he, what I'm saying it. is that he grew to that um, and grew to understand that that didn't mean that he couldn't still be an anarchist or whoever he was that didn't want that before. So I think it's, it's always about what steps are you taking that um, make your ownership more you? Like, you can own, but how do you become you every single day? And you is, now for me, you, my you is that I don't want to be the only one. So that wasn't the way it was several years ago. I wanted to be the only one. I was the only one, even though I wasn't really. You know, at the risk of just repeating what you said, said I think distinguishing between <coughs> owning and leading is really brilliant. And I'd never thought about that before. And it's true. The company, it's true with City Company, too. The, the company owns the company, and they're responsible to it. And the board of directors, I'm just repeating what you said, but yeah. I think it's worth repeating. But that our job is something else that's not about... So it's not my company. It's a company I have, I, I have taken this role of, of 
leadership in, and and it's a it's a role or it's a what, what were you saying function. earlier? It's a, it's a function of um, well, there are there are functions and there are roles, yeah. and and there's always this confusion because again we're you know even we are all grappling with what was the legacy we're bringing. So we are, have understandings that are a little bit askew, but it's hard to let go of them. So, so the fact that, like, I, I'm an artistic director, but I, I did not change my function as an actor at all. And I'm not really directing pieces, and I don't care, I mean, about doing that. But I do want to direct artistically the, the, the thing as a whole, instead of, like, I don't care about directing a, a, a performance or uh, small things. Uh, I care about directing training, for instance, or leading training. I do care about that. That's something that I was watching today in our session was that ev that company members are all directors too. So you have mm -hmm. to admit that it's it's not the ethos of um, Double Edge is not about waiting for a director to tell you what to do. Everybody's responsible for directing their own work, and I found that very encouraging today watching. And th th there is. There is one thing that, that I think that, the, that as, as society changes, the, the groups, groups of theater groups or groups of friends evolve and evolve, evolve into different, uh, like, you know, ways of taking responsibility, of making jokes, of, uh, you know, of, of roles. There are roles that are, like, for instance, there are roles that you would see that are, you can write down, this is the job. But then there are roles that are not written down, like, you know, my, my role to be a, like a container of crisis. I like to do that. Give me a crisis, I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> don't put me in a stable situation, I don't know what to do with those things. So, but different people have different roles, and, those, and then there are like, like secret packs that we have. So there is, you know, there is a short circuit, oh, Carlito. Or there is, you know, how do we go forward? You know, and you wait for the for the person that you know is gonna go forward, like the same as you play a sport. You know, like that's why we play soccer to understand that. Sorry. Speaking of playing soccer. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Matthew. Oh, there, there's uh, yeah. someone at hand. Also, I think someone in the uh, the the ether, the inter ether, is uh, the inter -ether. calling. My question is, when you have shared leadership on the artistic level. How do you deal with the challenges of different aesthetic values or different perceptions of quality and what helps to guide you through those challenges? So the, the question was, uh, for those of you who didn't hear it, um, when you share the artistic leadership, how do you deal with differences in aesthetic value and such and then what guides you through those, um, those differences? Matthew. <laughs> Have I told you about precarious? <laughs> Anne did that to me, so I'm doing it to you. Oh. Um, you, you just dance with it, I guess. You just dance with it, I think. Um, and I, I, I think there's, um, well, there's one thing from being, uh, well, I think it's, for me, I, I want to say, like, I, I, I started as a student here. Um, I did not, I was not, I was not nearly old enough to be a part of its founding. Um, both Stacy and Carlos founded companies and um, I came as a, as a, you know, as a mentee. So I have a lot of training about, um, from that process also and afterwards as an actor about how important things don't die. <laughs> um, it must be true. Uh, That's so, where that vodka went. Yeah. <laughs> That's for later. Uh, so I, I, you know, there's that. I think there's, uh, I feel like time is always um, a friend in that sense. Um, and I feel that um, there's a, a, a patience and then there's a continual back and forth. So, and I also think there's times where they're not going to meet. And I, you know, I have an inventory of things that... I'll, uh, you know, I'm going to put into something else someday. I, I think it's also, and it's maybe a parallel between the, the two situations, but that idea, the idea of how you deal with aesthetic disagreement is a constant part of an actor's relationship with the director. Mm -hmm. 
because it could be that if I'm if I'm and and the reason why I bring that up is that in both situations we have shared leadership between people who were functioning just as directors and then actors who were working with them already. So nine times out of ten working on anything, Anne's aesthetic opinion, I'm great, fine, let's go with that. That one time out of ten, because I have experience working with her as an actor, I know how to negotiate that in terms of okay yeah and then and and as an actor part of part of your art is finding how to find your own aesthetic skin in the game of something that didn't start out as something that you were that interested in you have to grow that you have to find that or you also find subtle ways to mind control and <laughs> influence them you mean it, silently <laughs> subvert it <laughs> <laughs> and and there's and so in or, or bluntly do whatever you want. Yeah, and, and see what happens. And, sure. And sometimes, sometimes you you act as if you didn't hear it correctly, and you you know do it, and then she goes like, oh, that's actually better. And sometimes she's like, no, do it the way I told you to. But but that sort of negotiation, that sort of negotiation is part of the process. It's part of the work, and and it's it's not it's not the case. I mean. Sometimes I think people think about shared artistic leadership as we, when we're confronted with something, we vote, and there's, and it's, and it's, you know, it's a tricameral government, but it's not that. It's, it's that, it's that we, when we're faced with something, we find consensus, consensus. amongst the amongst the three of us, and and we have, and from working on plays, we already have decades of doing that doing and not just doing it occasionally doing it all day sitting in a room with each other and finding consensus moment to moment to moment because that's what it is to build a play and so for us it makes complete sense and it's completely natural but i think sometimes yeah i, th I think it's a really really natural question that you ask but it's it's something that is is B baked into how how we already had related to each other. I think I'm wondering if there's within what you're sensing as natural within that topography, if there's any type of like essence or ethics. And I mean, the main thing I've heard is like you just stay together. Mm -hmm. That sort of came out of both of your answers. But if there's any type of like essence to what that is that could be defined, that would be interesting. Well, I think. One thing um, maybe that makes that question not so difficult is that we're, we're, we're not sharing something, a business, well, we do have a business, but the, we have an ensemble. So anytime somebody disagrees, whatever they're doing, they could do next time because the ensemble stays together and works together. So you're, if it's important, like we say, our improvisations, we, we use 2% of our improvisations and the rest goes into the trash can. Or it goes into the archives that you take something important out of that and you do it. The next time so you have a constant source of being able to achieve your aesthetic or artistic or whatever um, necessities so that one time it might be like we can't have a residency now because we have too much work and we really somebody wants to have that residency well, maybe we do have too much work, so we can't have it now, but that doesn't mean that in two years that person can't achieve that residency. So there's really no, no place for, there, there is disagreement, but it's about schedule. It's about um, maybe time or, or something, but not about the essence. I think that something that 
I tend to think it has been like a, how do you say that word in English? Panacea? Panacea? Panacea. 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 It's a training for this particular thing. The fact that we train even before we are even thinking about, we constantly train. We are not thinking about the product. We are not thinking about the business. That allows us to have a ritual where we can learn or relearn how to think these things because we, we do have differences in training. But, but you learn how to deal with them. So this thing that Stacy was mentioning about the time, there is also, um, in three hours of a training, there you create a, a, an indefinite amount of time where you're relating with these 9, 10, 11 people that you're working with. If you do that constantly every day, that teaches you something. It's like a re retraining. I would also say, I, I, I really agree with that. And when I brought up soccer the other a few minutes ago, it was in order to move to training, and which is something that both companies share. And it, when, when the city company started, the, the actors got together and they said, what does it mean to be a city company actor? And they all agreed instantly that they trained together. And um, I mentioned this the other night to a number of, here, of those who are here, uh, so I'll, I'll just repeat it, which is we were in Dublin a, a number of years ago doing uh, two shows at the International Festival in Dublin and the next week we did a third show at BAM, and the following week after that we did a fourth show in Los Angeles. And I was saying to my friend Jocelyn Clark, who's a, a uh, he's a, a, a dramaturg from, from Ireland, I said, how, and he knows us very well, I said, how are we managing that? I mean, this is impossible. And he said, oh, you're managing it because you train together. And the profundity of that hit me. I think the reason we share an aesthetic, and aesthetics, Picking up on Matthew's etymological discourse actually just means sensation. Like anesthetic is what happens with no sensation. And, and that what we share is sensation. And sensation is created through time spent together and training. And was there, a, can we go on to training? Or there was a question there from, was a question. from there was a question. Yeah, it actually, I think it fits really well. Oh, good. The question is from Toby Berkovici, and it's how do you recognize what areas of growth your ensemble members need as performance and artists? As in, you might find a training groove and get really good at one thing, but how do you keep pushing the envelope and knowing where to push it? Mystery. <laughs> well, part, let me, I'll take a stab, but part of it is that I think, like, if we think of an ensemble as an artist or a, a collective functioning as an artist, an, a really important thing for an artist is to stay in tune with their interest. What are, what are you interested in? What do you want? What do you what are you exploring? Where where what what are you looking at? And that's something that's always changing. And something something that we often forget is that. We don't necessarily, it's two things, and I, I learned this from you, actually, but um, I said that like it was an accusation. <laughs> How dare you teach me anything? No. <laughs> the, that that we, we forget that we don't always know what our interest is. We actually have to do things to discover what our interest is. We don't just know it and what our real interests are. And our interests change across time. So you have to keep doing that thing. And that's part of what, what training is a, on a certain level. But the, as the sort of Ouija board of the direction of the, the company shifts, all of us artists in the company are looking at that. And then in terms of training, in terms of, of study, in terms of preparation, we're, we are responsible for trying to stay aligned with that in a, in a productive way. So what do I have to do so that I can pull my weight in this direction? But it's related to that interest. And, and it's, not, it's not a fixed point. It, it, it moves. Sometimes it moves subtly. And there, are, and there are certain things that don't move. There are certain things that you're always going to want. 
and and you can and training is is sort of home base for the stuff you're always going to want. But then there's the 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 percentage of that that is shifting depending on on where you're looking, and that's I mean in a certain sense that's the most exciting thing that that it's like oh now we're gonna we're gonna all study neuroscience now and we're gonna you know look at that as 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 an interest and each of us is going to do that in a slightly different way and that's going to be the the collective but i'm rambling one of the reasons why we are interested in making this shift of directions into a multiplicity of productions at the same time instead of one is because we are recognizing that there are passions and interests within the company that aren't fully being accounted for in the one at a time model that we've been doing and that there's that there is a multiplicity of passions in the company and can we build a collective structure that allows for the, that multiplicity to to <coughs> blossom rather than always trying to bundle it into one thing there are i think that there are there are things that, that merit development, and they're not for us to determine that this is going to happen <coughs> now. The group grows capacity, but there are, just to work with what Leon was, was observing, and what I observe is that the crux is that everybody needs to find meaning every moment, I think. And based on that meaning that everybody finds that each time, every day, every moment you go to training, there needs to be meaning. Don't try to find it in the business or in the direction of the business. Try to find it in the training, which is sensorial. It's not about ideas. It's the meaning that we find from our senses. And then from there on, there is a, a slow development of two things that to, to me are crucial for this to happen as a group, commitment and engagement. So working on the commitment and the engagement slowly, progressively, don't try to get, you know, a, um, a marriage uh, thing, you know, on paper. It's not going to work. You need to go step by step growing commitments uh, and, and, you know, and, 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 and engagements. And that then leads to investment, which is very connected to ownership, right? Mm -hmm. You know, what, one of the things that we share in common to, to companies is that not only do the companies train, but we train younger artists, many of whom are in the room right now. And why is that important? <laughs> well, I'll tell you. <laughs> go, go. It's your turn. Well, it goes, actually, go back to the original question uh, the, 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 about, about shared leadership. Also, part of shared leadership is about legacy. And I think, um, I, I think, City Company I would speak for, we all feel a responsibility to the world we live in and how we leave it. And, and sharing the discoveries so that you can then say they're all wrong, is, right Casey, is really important mm -hmm. to all of us. And for some reason, every actor in City Company is a really damn good teacher. I don't know how that happened. You might want to take some responsibility for that, I don't know. But, no, I think yeah. teaching is not something that you teach. You either have a way of imparting information or... You're a pretty good example, I am. <laughs> see? See? Not everything is like that. <laughs> He's buttering me up for something else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's about the disagreement. <laughs> <laughs> Why does Double A Edge uh, tra share their training? I'm looking at you because it's always, I feel like it's been a part of its mission, and it's been almost s since early on, at the very least, if not from the beginning or before that, to have the. Um, uh, I'm looking for a word, but I'm going to abandon that word because I can't find it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> although I, I love it. Watermelon. <laughs> I love the, the word that's floating out there at sea. Ice cream? Precarious. <laughs> Precarious. 
No. It's uh, <laughs> to impart its training to the next generation, both for that generation, uh, let's say there's a primacy to the future generations, um, but also I think it's part of the development of the training itself, that dialogue. Um, that's why I was looking at you, because I feel like that's since early, and also we come from, uh, we belong in a, in a constellation of uh, theaters that have training at, as a part of its source, and sharing training as a part of its culture. Um, and so we are, but we are also recipients as well as um, conduits. Uh, There's an, another thing that's on a, on a very, very practical level with it is that um, in, in the city company, whenever we are training a group of artists, the company members who aren't leading the class are in the class or taking the class which means that several times a year, uh, most of us go through the beginning stages of the training over again. Absolutely, like, and, like, yeah, like in martial arts. Yeah, yeah. I'm just thinking that. And it's inc incredibly healthy. And it's also, even, even when you get into more advanced levels, there's an aspect of classes, and, and this, is, this is true, and it's even true here in the work that we're doing here, when we're when we're leading a class, there is a part of your consciousness where you're not talking to your students, you're talking to your colleagues. That that and when you're taking the class, it's not it's not fake. I you know, I've been working with Akiko for over twenty-five years. I take a class that she's leading, I'm learning from her. Right. And and it's in a way that if she's leading just the company she doesn't say all that stuff. I get to know how, how she's unpacking the rudimentary things. And, that, and that's in a different way than she did 10 years ago. And so it's a way of us staying in tune with each other and learning from each other. In, and it's just the stuff that you're thinking, but you would just never say to your buddy. But if there's a third thing there to triangulate it off, we can communicate yeah. in a much more profound way. It's totally connected to our research. I mean, I think research is at the heart of our both of our yeah. um, searches, our, our, mean, our missions. So the, being able to research and having tra training uh, furthers and deepens <coughs> that, that research. We, 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 had a, one yeah. second. we had an exercise that was led by City Company, and it was how to see the space I've been training for 18 years now, I knew. And the way I saw it, I knew, was through you. I would look at you, surprising yourself, and say, oh, right, the light is coming from that end. Right? So I, I was kind of like following each one of you. So I'm, I was learning from you how to see the space I knew. So that, that, that is an example, I think, yeah. why I train people. We also want to train people who aren't um, theater people. Mm. Um, and we do open trainings, and those are really incredible mm. and very moving. Um, Why like, is that? Because um, there isn't any expectation or um, like expectation of uh, I need to be good or I need to show something. It's just um, like finding the child uh, in yourself, refinding the child in yourself in the training, which usually takes theater people um, longer, much longer than people who just are like they're running around or they're <laughs> going on the spool or something like that. Like it's fun. It doesn't have a um, a particular product or a need so that for for us those are really important to be able to have a dialogue with our neighbors or mm -hmm. not even just our neighbors but any like on tour uh, young people mm -hmm. or people who wouldn't go through a whole training program or 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 something like that um <coughs> The question I'd like to ask is, what do each of your companies do to 
feel intimate with what are the struggles of the culture you're in of the day. In other words, there's always universal themes you can focus on in all the plays, etc. But there's also particular challenges in the culture right now. I mean, people have a really hard time keeping their marriages together. Um, people have a really hard time dealing with this government system the way it's working. Um, those are just two quick examples off the top of my head, but what do each of the companies do to feel intimate with what is in play, you know, today, now, in the culture, that you want to be, you know, in dialogue with in a way, in the way you do what you do so that you are responsive to those things? Such a stunning question. Like, hmm. one of the best questions I've heard in a long time. And? <laughs> well, I would actually go back to the Greeks and what I've learned from the Greeks, meaning the Greeks, the ancient Greeks. It, it's become clearer and clearer to me why they discovered theater and drama. In, in the Western tradition. In the Western tradition. And the logic of it is phenomenal, which is Somehow they understood in this particular century that, that laws are necessary in order to keep, uh, um, hegemony is necessary in order to keep civilization in place. And that when it comes to law and the ways that things have to be, they must be obeyed or else there's chaos. What the theater does is actually ask the questions that you want to ask about the world we're living in, which you can't really ask in the political realm. The, the really important questions of family and hubris and the questions that laws are made to contain. So I think that <laughs> remains totally relevant right now, which is a, a, an artist's responsibility to be aesthetically connected with the world you live in, to be aware that one of the, the, of the problems that exist uh, because of the internet, which has made time insane, that makes me think that, that, that the, the one of the most radical things that the theater can do right now is change our experience of time, because the internet is making it go so fast. Um, as you mentioned, you know, families falling apart, new, new kinds of families being, being recreated. The fact that 80 people in the world own, what is it they discovered last week? Yeah. 48%. 48 percent of the wealth of the world. You know, the, the fact that the, 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 the middle class almost doesn't exist anymore, the difference between the rich and the, you know, these issues that I think you were touching on is the theater is the place that talks about how social systems can get along. And that's what distinguishes the theater from any other art form. The dance is not about social systems. Visual art isn't. Performance art isn't. But the theater asks the questions about how we might get along better. So I think, as was mentioned earlier, when we form companies, I think Leon said, we're saying, this is how we think it might go. And when we work on a play, we say, this is a proposal of how we might get along better. So not only in the subject of the play, which using the Greeks is still about, you know, he killed his father and, married, and slept with his mother. That's an interesting subject, but also how the actors are together, how the audience is getting along with each other, how the audience and the actors are getting along. What changes in that environment is particularly in relationship to the issues that are chosen to meditate on. Okay, and, and do you mind if I add something more? Yeah. Is it okay? Please. Um, you can't legislate moral behavior. <clears throat> moral behavior is when you freely choose to give priority to the common good. So you can't legislate, okay? It can only be a free choice. You can make all the laws in the world you want. And you were talking about the Greeks, and you have to follow the rules. We're beyond that now. We now have to somehow rise above and to freely choose to be moral mm -hmm. beyond the laws. That seems like a really big, important, intimate conversation of this drunk on individualism yeah. society. 
and yeah. drunk on individual freedoms and stuff. Yeah. So that's an, I think you just touched on a very good example of the kind of thing that we need to be in dialogue about, yeah. about that theater could have us wake up to. Yeah. And, you know, a way that we have, of course, you know, in, imperfect as everything we do, but the comp our companies have a different way of producing theater. And therefore, like, f talking from our side, I, we have a, a very strong integration uh, in the way the company is produced with the surrounding community and other communities. Like, a lot of people are, through that camera, they are connected today with us. That's a community. And we do have that intimate conversation somehow with them. And it happens when they're either helping us plow the snow and because, you know, they come and they do it and we are there also. Or, you know, helping us with the roof or, you know, with the truck. And we, we establish these conversations and, and the conversations happen. Or, or in these conversations, like where you're bringing it, I'm, now I'm sensitive to what you are saying. That's a way to connect. There was, I think there were that um, I, our way is um, about potential and trying to find in the training and the performance and ourselves and our each other um, a potential that may or may not um, be something people are attain attaining to. Um, we have a, um, I mean, I'm not going to get into the whole things wrong with society, and that's not really the point. Um, to me, any time you can give people courage to um, try to reach their potential in, in whatever area they want to, or just in their being, instead of allow themselves to go along with the flow of life or the dictates or the demands of life. Um, and I think many people give up that willingness or courage to find their potential. To me, that is the, the prime thing that I'm trying to do with my work, with myself, with my colleagues, and with my audience or my community, is to give some courage. Um, and it doesn't need to be a specific it doesn't really have anything to do with a specific idea or a subject matter anymore. Um, it has to do with what speaks to our willingness to go to that potential. I, I really like the, this phrasing that, that you gave it of being intimate with issues. I think that's a really great way to think about it because I, I don't my, myself, I don't think that the theater is a place for me to express my opinion about those issues or to, I, well, maybe I could express my opinion. It's not where I expect to transmit that opinion in a, some way that's going to try to convince you. But it's very, I think it's fundamentally confusing to be a theater artist right now in the United States in terms of this issue because we get very few signals from our society that they value us. They're, we have to live on the margins. That's been true for vast times of history for the theater, so it's not that unique a, a time and place. But we're not supported by the society in a way that says to us, we're going to look to you for as a place to think about issues. We, and everything gets boiled down to the, the value of your product. And if you don't have a product that's gonna sell millions of tickets, then why should anybody care? Which is a very strange thing to say in the arts, but we say it in this country a lot. 
And so our role in, in terms of those larger issues in the society is difficult to suss out. We, we're being told, you have to make something that makes people want to come and see it. And then we're told, yeah, but you didn't spank them when they did on, on, a, on a certain level. And, and it's, it's, there's, there's, a, it, it gets, there's a cognitive dissonance. And Anne came up with a phrase that, that we've very much latched onto and, and have made part of our mission. And because it, it, it really encapsulates, I think, part of what we've been trying to do in the theater fundamentally, which is to see the theater as a gymnasium for the soul. That we want people to come and work out. And whatever the soul means. That just come in and we're gonna we're gonna do this thing and hopefully my hope always when I look out into an audience, I hope it's completely ecumenical. That that I hope they're you know that it's politically purple, that that we've got people sitting next to each other that if they went past the surface, they completely disagree with each other about all the fundamental things. And I hope they're sitting next to each other and experiencing a common thing. Not that they're having the same experience, but they're having a touchstone that's, that's related. Because I think that is something I'm not confused about is the function. That we, are, that, we are, that we are something that can be looked at from more than one angle and therefore could be a place where people who are being segmented by every other force in society might say, okay, there's a thing you both had. Yes, the same is true of sunsets, but we don't always notice that. And, and so then maybe they might start talking. Maybe they might start noticing a, the commonality of their humanity, which might then lead to, heaven forbid, dialogue. <laughs> Um, I was saying, like, let's say the, the world is falling apart with many, many problems, and what the, let's say, Double Edge is doing in, in, in uh, their artistic work to approach this, what's, what's happening around. And I used to think, like, gosh, we have this issue, this issue, this issue. And there's a, a, a spe spectacle, there's a, a show uh, in a double edge that is not uh, connected to any of the things that it, it, it sometimes look like for me, like, well, we are in one spot and double edge is another one. And I was trying to understand this. Uh, until I did, it had to do with a stage, uh, a stage just said that I think a position, uh, the, the single existence of the double edge is a response for what's going on. Mm -hmm. You have to be brave. Yeah. To, and I understood this later. Like, Wow, because that has to do also with the piano. And I have one, one question. <laughs> it has to do with the piano, too. I think the piano has, is a symbol, like it's a beautiful symbol, because now, yeah, it's falling apart, but we have a piano here that we need to carry, and we cannot, now, it's a nice piano, we very, very careful with, and we need everyone. Are you willing to carry this piano with us or not? Um, now, uh, my question is, <laughs> <laughs> because I, 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 I was, no, I, I, I was an actor in Brazil, and I have that piano too in front of me, and I, I, do, I didn't know how to deal with that piano very much. The piano, what I'm saying is like, I was, a young actor, actor. I, I was, I, I want to be an actor, I want to be on stage, I want to be an artist, I want to, that's what I want, I don't want to be carrying piano around. 
I didn't want to do that. So today, <laughs> I know that uh, I missed that. Now, I, I, I know that I didn't carry that piano. The, a lot of things happened or didn't happen because I didn't know how to deal with that piano. And because I thought that the, the cake was on the stage. And on stage was everything. So what can you say, <coughs> Matthew, Carlos? What can you say? Uh, I'm sorry I don't, uh, my ignorance about uh, the second company. You know, I, I know a, a half, I have, I'm half ignorant with double edge. I don't know everything, but I, I just know a piece. But what we say for us, the students, now, because we want to be on the stage, we want to be on the front row, I think. I'm, if it's, so I'm, but we want to be, now, let's say we want to be an a, a artistic director. We want to be part of this. Like, what was the really advice that you would say for us that is studying here, putting uh, energy here and what you think like like uh, uh, Matthew how how did you deal with the piano before you were not a, 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 a disc director how was that to do stuff that maybe would be not exactly what you were thinking about doing at that moment okay that's it that's my question uh, <clears throat> I think I fell in love with an idea uh, or or uh, and uh, and even more and and probably I fell in love with a a, a a type of space of work and then I I just wanted to continue to find out how to be in that space of work and how then to protect that space of work so. <clears throat> um, I would say, uh, you know, when I came, after I trained here, Alex, I came back here first because I left my car here. <laughs> <laughs> so, lucky <laughs> accident. Uh, explains everything. <laughs> yeah, leave your car somewhere. <laughs> um, and then uh, I had a question about where I needed to be next. But I knew that there was a space to ask the question. So I, I, went, I, I, I went to that space, which was here, to find out where to be next. And what I found was a place and a group of people to ask my question. And no matter what I was doing, as long as I was engaging in that, which was a, a, a feeling, I felt very connected and wanted to continue. Um, so for me, like the jobs of moving hay when I came here uh, and, and shoveling snow and such are, are, were, were very meaningful because I was also working on uh, you know, my, my growth. And then ultimately this, what I think of and what Carlos would call a, a movement of sorts. So. I think it, when, if, you're, if one feels connected in some uh, irrational or, or subtle way to go nearer to it and find out what then happens and spend time with it uh, and, and give and receive with it, it might, I don't know. I mean, it sort of seems, uh, it's sort of, a, it's just a, sen it's a sensitivity thing. And there's also to be uh, uh, very much in the unknown of it. I don't know if, if I can, I don't know if I feel comfortable giving and advice training. And, and training. I, yeah. I observe something, I don't know if I can give advice, but I observe that when you, Alex, say, you know, I think that the, the, the cake was to be on stage, you're already making a definition, a decision of something. To me, it's not that I'm here to move a piano. The cake is not to move the piano. 
and and or is not to park cars or be the you know like I, I've been on the telephone or or you know mo shoveling snow, but at the moment that something which is larger than me assigns me to be there, that becomes the thing. So then the thing, you know, it could be being on stage, but at the same time it also could be moving the piano, or it could be moving these benches, or it could be building the benches, or it could be, with, you know, sharing with you in the summer. But it's not, a, it's not up to me. It, I, I, leave it, I leave it to chance. And whatever pops and, you know, is being told, not by any of them, actually, it's actually being told by something larger than us. When it snowed, I mean, we didn't, we didn't decide the snow, that's right, but it did. So, you know, you need to shovel. That's it. The, the, um, it I know you asked that, but just to jump in, the, the city company very much formed in relationship to another company, a company in Japan called the Suzuki Company of Toga, where a lot of us trained and, and learned the, the Suzuki method. And I was a member of that company before we formed the, the city company. And there are a lot of very strong, uh, beautiful parallels between that company and Double Edge in terms of uh, that the Suzuki Company of Toga is located in a small village in the mountains of Japan. And they have buildings and they're having to move a lot of pianos. Um, and Suzuki used to say to us, we are not actors or, or designers or technicians or, or cooks. We are theater people. We are all making theater. And on any given day, that might mean cleaning a toilet or manning the box office or playing the lead role. And the important thing in that understanding, and I really see it in, in these dudes being here for a week, what the really important thing is that when you're standing on the stage and eating that particular cake, you don't forget that somebody shoveled the walk for you to get there and that that person is a theater maker too. And, that, and so it has to flow both ways. The consciousness of it, the awareness of it has to go both ways for the collective to work. And the minute the person on the stage forgets that if the person who built the stage that they're standing on hadn't done a good job, they would fall over. The collective is weaker. That consciousness is so important that it be on all levels going both ways. I also think it's not just about a company like ours, but um, one thing I noticed in training with you and Stephen and Akiko and, and Anne is when you go into the work, there's, there's no, um, it's a direct democracy, um, meaning that you're not like taking everyone when you're working and showing people how to do it. You're doing your work mm -hmm. and you're sharing with the other person. Um, their work. So nobody is, you know, I've only been doing this for a day and I've been doing this. You even did that with our group. So there is, this is a very particular type of work we're talking about, our ensembles, and we're, we're not talking about a stage and cake. We're, we're talking about, again, we're talking about ownership. The people who are doing it own it. The students have to own their part in the work. Even if they don't own the group, they have to own their work. So it's not like somebody has something that you don't have. This is very antithetical to another type of entertainment theater experience. <coughs> so I, I think at its, at its roots, the ensemble, or whatever you call this thing that we're trying to be part of, um, is different. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Why? <laughs> no, it's okay. <laughs> this is really inspiring. Um, I've had a few questions, and I think I narrowed it down to this one for now. 
Um, having been a theater artist for a while, I'm not quite as young as some of the beautiful ones in here. Um, having been in the city and now moving, living in rural Vermont with some other theater artists and finding it really, and having done ensemble work and doing theater that, that means something in the world and asking questions and, and trying to make dialogue amidst a world that wants the entertainment and traditional living room sets and wanting to break free of that but not knowing how to, um, I guess, ignite the excitement in others or create a space for that when there doesn't seem to be much. I guess I want to know how you've done it and here you are, you are rural. You've done it out in the middle of Asheville, that's wonderful. Um, and I'm sure that exists as well in, um, in the New York City or in other cities um, because I'm just finding it very challenging. So if you have any... Uh, Can I say something about Double Edge yeah. that I've observed? And I've said this to you guys before, is that I've been watching them for a number of years and they have changed so much in how they relate to each other. I think their work is developed. I think how they relate to the community. And I think that's why they're so successful. Because they're adapt they're 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 adjusting to what's actually happening. And I think that if you come in and just say, this is the way it has to be, damn the torpedoes, you will you will turn brittle and crumble from being too I just wanted to open with that. I know that's a question for you guys. <coughs> But that's my observation. Of yeah, I mean, I think that's pretty much the key to the story. Um, it's we're, This is our 20th anniversary in Ashfield. So let's say we're, we're arriving at what you just, all the things you just said. It, it's been a 20 year process of, um, you know, hiding for a while and then not hiding and then hiding again and, and finding something that worked um, be really um, our stubbornness in the beginning was a bad stubbornness and our stubbornness now is a good stubbornness I think Allowing survival to be your guide is important. And I mean real survival, not like, well, if I do Hello Dolly, I'll get a bunch of tickets. But actually, I won't really get a bunch of tickets. And anyway, tickets <laughs> don't give you enough money, so it's not that. But like real, like what are the values of real survival? Um, I think that's really important. and. It's important as as a group to really discuss that and understand that, um, and you're not adapting your values; you're growing your values. I think. Mm -hmm. Ali was first. Um, I want to go back to training. Because um, to me, that's really like one of the major main events of this entire week is two different companies meeting with remarkably, in some ways, different and also really similar training techniques. So I think it'd be really informative to hear about, you know, so far, what are the resonances that you have all seen between your ways of working? And also, what are some of the key differences? Um, and maybe looking ahead, it's probably a little too early to really ask this, but I'll ask it anyway. Um, you know, is there anything you might take from this in terms of like, oh, that's sort of different, and maybe we've been ignoring that element of working, or like that's showing us something that we haven't been conscious of for some reason in our training work? Um, yeah, so resonances, differences. You know, before that question is answered, I would like to ask you, having just gone through both trainings, <laughs> it's a nice right. feeling that it's going to happen. Nice. <laughs> you nice find man. yourself for it because I'm, you're the one who experienced it. I knew that was going to happen. What, I have to, I guess what I have is to. the topic? <laughs> 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 or your lead. <laughs> or go back and train more. Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, so it was interesting. I uh, had done like a tiny bit of viewpoints before, like a year ago or whatever, two years ago, and then um, 
I did this past August a two week little mixed level workshop at City Company. Um, so we're doing Suzuki and viewpoints of reality. Um, and before that, I had been a double edge in various ways for a couple of years, and one of which was being here for three months for an immersion. Um, so that was sort of my background. And um, I remember being really excited by what Suzuki and Viewpoints had because there, there was um, a structure there. Even if in Viewpoints it's kind of a loose postmodern structure, there, there are overarching structures that you can tap into to work and to kind of like categorize the work you're doing, which is very bodily based work. Um, and that allows in some ways its own type of freedom. And then there's Double Edge, which is at least at first glance externally a little bit more, much more free form and maybe mysterious. Um, partly because there's much less talking used to teach it. Um, but there are actually underlying principles, I think, to the training here. Um, what are those? <laughs> what did you learn? <laughs> <laughs> just so you know, just so you know, Anne believes in this thing that's called the violence of articulation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're experiencing. You're experiencing. Well, it's like the, it's the crisis of the of the creative moment, right? It's like you induce a crisis, so you have to produce something. So I guess that's what's happening to me now. Um, well, so. <laughs> I don't want to get too much on a tangent, but double-edged to me is something that I've been working with coming back and a big part of my research is you you don't, you know, so like if you go to a double-edged training, you see people moving around a room in various ways. It can look very different. If you go on Tuesday night or Thursday night, it might look completely different. But underlying that, it's not people just messing around and moving for the sake of moving around and using their bodies because we don't much today in Western society. Like, that's really not the point. Um, it's about, one, kind of tapping into an energy that we don't necessarily tap into normally. Interestingly enough, Suzuki, I think, does that too. They call it the animal energy. There are other, like, dance techniques that work very specifically with that kind of wild, irrational energy that we all have. Um, so it's tapping into that, harnessing it, um, learning what it is, and also through physical, very intentional physical actions, starting to tap into something that's beyond physicality, which is the psyche and the imagination, which is directly linked to what we do with our body. So you can go either way, like some acting techniques, it's psychology into the body, this one, it's sort of body into a more imaginative world that you can live in. Um, that was good. That was really good. Thanks. Stop uh, while you're ahead. That was yeah. good. <laughs> I agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so maybe I'll stop now and just say like... I agree. Know, I want to not answer this question by saying something, though. Um, I think that um, this has been a very profound week for me. Um, I... Um, I haven't had this deep of an exchange about training um, with another company. So um, I don't have any like words about what the differences are, what the same are or something. I mean, they, I, they're resonating in my head, but I think the idea of exchange is maybe um, like is this week for me. And I think that is extremely important. I, I share um, your difficulty in speaking because the work I've seen, your company, you, the, the work with our conservatory and our company, I have no words for it yet. I found it so profound and so both contemporary and ancient simultaneously and free that uh, it's going to take me a while to process it. It's incredibly moved by what I've seen to the point that, and it's not usual for me to have no words. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. 
you have nothing to say, and you're saying. <laughs> there, we should take a couple before Seth. Can okay. we just get go with the few sure. of the? Sure. Um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> sure we're always taking intentional risks organizationally, artistically, and also find consensus. How do we find consensus without watering down the final product, collaborate but not compromise to a fault? I would like to answer that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and, um, and you're going to think I'm being irresponsible, but I'm absolutely serious, which is that all great questions have exactly the same answer, and that was a great question. And I'm going to answer it if you would read it one more time because it's so profound. It's such a brilliant, brilliant. Um, how do we make sure we're always taking intentional risks organizationally and artistically and also find consensus? How do we find consensus without watering down the final product, collaborate but not compromise to a fault? The answer is exactly. <laughs> <laughs> when you can form a question like that, you have started the work. And that's the only place to start. And it's brilliant. And I hope we all heard that. And I would reify it in my own soul. Next. That's <laughs> <laughs> it. Okay. So how do each of your companies systematically and pragmatically take ownership and fiscal responsibility for what you're doing? Because the hierarchy of the granting system and funding system is completely fucked as well. So from going to presenter conferences that I just don't want to go to anymore, the presenters up here, the booking agents, and the artists are like way down under negative zero. Oh, you so, Oh, Jesus. <laughs> I've been to Wong, Arts Midwest, Arts Northwest, APAP for five years. I'm going to die. <laughs> so like how Stop so going. yeah no not, not, well well and and but part of this is 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 because I you know want to make money doing I, this. so I just I wonder how your companies that's do the it problem. I think okay. and it, it ties into what you were asking I think you know I my dad was a great salesman and I learned interesting things from him and. Um, one is that he made the most money, and he made a ton of money, selling door-to-door. -door. A product that costed $1,000, telling people that he didn't want to sell it and proving it. I'm not going to sell you this, and it's $1,000. This is a promotion. And people would, you know, 10 days after, keep asking him. He sold so much. The thing is not about money. And the thing is not about gathering tons of people. We almost no one is going to see our work. But that almost no one is already, we're talking about a million in America. If by 1% of the people you can reach with what you do in the U.S., I mean, that's so much that you cannot even going to be able to handle it. So... We don't reach a million people. No. <laughs> No, almost, I, and that's what I mean, almost no one. We reach, you know, hopefully through the internet, we, we have been reaching 80,000 people at max. And that's a lot. And we cannot handle it even, so who cares? I mean, we, can, we cannot handle 60, for Christ's sake. So, and we cannot even charge money for that. But the problem is how we think about money and how we think about, this also ties into what you're saying about the cake on stage. It, it's not about money. It's not about masses. It's not about, it's about almost no one. And, but us believing what we do. But that doesn't put food on the table. That's yes, it I does. Mean. Yes, it does. It depends how you organize and how you structure yourself. I mean, I've been living so off of this for 30 want, years. That's what I want in Argentina, not in America. Yeah, but how? <laughs> because I because each each person each each art uh, each art needs to have their own how. I cannot give you my how. It, it won't work probably for you. But I, you know, we can think about your how. Your how is unique, and you need to find it. It's part of your art. <laughs> I have a how for you. 
Yeah. I, I actually, I hate those th th those places that you're talking about. Where oh, yeah. You go to yeah, yeah. But, but there are certain individuals who are sometimes not in there, but are rotating around at various bars, who are actually the people who will get you commissions and money. And, um, and I had an experience, and we probably have to stop after this, because it's a, it's a little story, is that there's a, there's a film director that I admire a lot, who made a film years ago called 38 Films About Len Gould, or 57, yeah. did you see that? 32 films. Francois Girard is his name, he's Canadian. And I always admired him, and I was, I was invited to a dinner party uh, by some really wacky uh, money laundering um, filmmakers in New York once, and I went because they throw good parties. And, and I ended up sitting next to him, and I was so thrilled that this guy I admired so much was sitting next to me. And, um, and at the middle of dinner, he turned to me and he said, and he was in New York because he had a film he was trying to sell. And he turned to me and he said, would you like to hear the story of my film? And I said, yes, <laughs> I'd love to. And he said, there was a, there was a man uh, who, who's, he was a, a violin maker and his wife died in childbirth and he was completely bereft. And as he's telling me this, he's like checking me out to see how the story's going. And he said, um, and he was so bereft that he took the violin that he was working on and he painted it with her blood. And this guy, Francois Girard, started to tell me the story of this violin, which went from one culture to another, century to century. You might know the film I'm talking about now called The Red Violin, which got made. And I realized at a certain point that he didn't turn to me because I was a film producer. But I had no way of helping him make his film. I believe that he made his film because he turned to me and said, do you want to hear the story of my film? And that that kind of uh, 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 impulse in the world is why you make things. Because you turn to the person next to you and you say, do you want to hear the story of my film? And that starts a process that's completely out of your control. And it's a very pure one and, um, and it, that our job as artists is not to have the managing director do it for you or the book the bookkeeper do everything. Our job is to actually uh, create partnerships, whether that's with foundations, whether that's with presenters. You do have to find people who will listen. And, and it's not immediate. In those places you're talking about, there's incredible snobbery in that uh, arena. No, but, yeah, yeah, there but there places. are also amazing people. Oh, yeah. And you can't. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and I just, that's, that's. Bravo. I love that answer. Um, thank you. We are now at the stage where we're going to say thank yous. Um, and Ritha? Yes. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, I just wanted to share that we have a meal that we would love to share with you um, that's donated um, in part by some of the local businesses and restaurants around here. Um, and that's, I think, speaks very much to our community and how they really connect so beautifully with us. So we have donated food from the Clay Oven, which is an Indian restaurant in Greenfield, from Hardy Eats in Shelburne Falls, from um, Eflon Cafe in Hadley, and then from Bread Euphoria, which has been a long-term donor of ours. They've been donating bread and pastries um, almost every week. So um, we'll have that set up, and please enjoy. Oh, and, one more, and Four Seasons Wine is also there. So. And I just want to um, conclude the gratitude uh, with two very important acknowledgments. Uh, the first is to HowlRound um, for providing the platform and the conditions and the philosophy of a, of a theater-based commons um, for, around which this conversation is happening. So thank you to HowlRound and HowlRound TV, <laughs> New Play TV. Uh, and lastly, to the network of ensemble theaters who we acknowledged at the beginning for making this exchange and this residency possible. If you don't know about the network of ensemble theaters, it speaks to your question as well, Terry, about relating intimately to larger issues. Uh, the work of NET is, is really important and great, and we are very appreciative for this opportunity to them. And thank you all. Thank you.